Welcome back to our podcast on Solid Ground. This is now part two of our episode with Leo Cannon from Barrel Engineering on Milestone Inspections. So Leo, what do Milestone Inspections typically look like and how are they different from regular inspections? So I think to answer that question, we have to go backwards to go forwards. We have to talk about why does this even exist? So let's go back to June 21st, 2021. We're going to go to Miami. Um, there was a building in Miami that collapsed. Um, you can watch the video. Um, they've done countless case studies on it. But a building collapsed. Um, it was a 13-story building, kills 98 people. Uh, through the course of the determining why the building collapsed, it was a combination of construction defects and deferred maintenance. Mm -hmm. Tragic. The state of Florida then said, hey, we have a lot of old buildings. And while mm -hmm. Miami-Dade County has a, has a requirement to inspect buildings that are 40 years old, this one wasn't. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to prevent this from happening again? So they decided that within the one year anniversary of that collapse for the Surfside condominium building, they were gonna create a bill to enact inspections and budgets to make sure that the buildings could be maintained. So what ended up happening was you had a two page bill for a citizen's property insurance that became an 88 page bill over a weekend. Now, if you know about government, normally there's committees and committees write a bill and it gets edited and all this other, and it goes from the house to the Senate yeah. and back and forth. Yeah. This didn't have any of that, just got passed. So the first version of this bill was rough. But they did it. They, they got it within the one year anniversary of the Surfside mm -hmm. collapse. And now we just are entering into the third version of this bill, which is House Bill 1178. Hmm. Wow. How many pages is the bill? Just out of curiosity. Well, the first it's version like, was 88. 88 now I think we're like in the 120s. Okay. They keep, wow. they keep adding to it, fixing it. They needed <clears> to <throat> fix it. Um, there was some really squirrely things in there. But back to your question is, what do they look like? Mm -hmm. It is a full building inspection of your structure, your roof, your electrical, your plumbing, um, your foundation walls. Um, basically, it's a non-invasive visual inspection looking for structure, substantial structural damage. Interesting. Okay. And who typically receives these types of inspections? Is it only reserved for businesses or how does that work? So this, the, this inspection is geared for condominium buildings that are specifically three or more stories tall that are 30 years or older. Okay. So that, that is the current bucket that they are targeting. So if you have a 30 story bill, a 30 year old building, three stories or more as defined by the building department. Mm -hmm. So we get asked the question, like I have this fake floor for a garage or I have this flake, fake floor because I live in a flood zone. Does it count? If your building department says you are three stories, you are three stories. If it says that garage doesn't count and you're two stories, then you don't need it. But if you meet the criteria, three stories, 30 years of age, and you're a condominium, so co-ops, townhomes, the mm -hmm. apartment buildings, you have to be a condominium. If you meet those criteria, you need to have this inspection done. Interesting. Okay. And it needs to be done by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Is there end, a end deadline? Is that end still um, well, the, the deadline? Deadline is you have to be under a contract uh, by the end uh, of the year. So this was interesting. And in, in this year is, and I was involved in this committee discussion, our firm, Barrel, is capable of doing 5% of the known condominiums out there that need this inspection done by end of year. And I say known because mm -hmm. they estimate there's somewhere between 23 and 26,000 condominiums that need to have this done. However, only 11,000 have registered to say, hey, we know we need this done. So of that number, we could do, we, we calculated, we could do 5% of the available the available ones. And there's not a whole lot of firms wanting to do this. And I'll, I'll get into that later. Uh, mm -hmm. There's another firm out there who can do 10% of the reserve study portion of it, which is the financial analysis, but they can't do the physical inspection. So it's messy. Yeah, that was a, a question I was asking one of my, uh, one of my attorney friends is, is, do you think there's enough capacity in the market, like barrel engineering and other engineers to do these 22,000 buildings or even have them under contract by the end of the year. Um, is that just, is that humanly possible um, based on the amount of engineering resources we have in the state that are, from what you're telling me, are even willing to do these? And I'm sure you'll mention some reasons why 
engineers are not jumping on the milestone inspection bandwagon or the on the uh, the team to get all these done um, within a pretty tight timeline that's been set by the state. So to answer that question, we got to look at how many engineers do we have in the state of Florida? We have about 95,000 engineers that have been licensed in the state of Florida since they started licensing engineers. Doesn't count the ones who died. Doesn't count the ones, or actually that number counts the ones who died, counts the ones who lost their license due to malpractice, counts the ones who were retired, counts the ones who have moved and are no longer practice in Florida. 95,000 is the number of engineers you've had and counts the ones that do like electrical or plumbing or aerospace. Mm -hmm. So when you truly look at the number of available engineers that could do this work, not even that would turn it down, but that even could do this work, it's like a one-to-one ratio. Like if every engineer who's licensed in the state of Florida, who is qualified to do this work, whether or not they wanted to do it or not, just qualified. If each engineer did one, we'd have just enough engineers. Hmm. But that's not how it works. A lot of engineers don't want to touch this type of work. Uh, Other engineers um, don't specialize in taller buildings. They don't Mm -hmm. specialize because the way that it's written is any professional engineer could do one of these inspections. So I'm an electrical engineer. I could technically do one of these inspections. I'm not an electrical engineer. I, I can do electrical engineering, but I practice building engineering. But I um, just need to clarify that because yeah. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I was, but um, so, yeah, so when, you, when it gets down to it, and then with the way the bill was originally written, the engineer had to be the one doing the inspection. Even though everything else engineers do, we can, we can manage a team. The whole yeah. point of being a principal engineer is you have a team under you. So the later versions of this bill, uh, Senate Bill 154 and now House Bill 1178, allowed it to open up to teams. Mm -hmm. Because when you got down to who was actually willing to do this work, you're in the hundreds. Wow. The hundreds out of 95,000 potential. Jeez. And that leads me into my my next question. How can you vet these milestone inspectors and make sure that they're reputable, the ones that are available? So engineers are generally a very conservative – scared lot they don't like taking risks Mm -hmm. and everything about this is risk so and the reason why i say that is you have a bill a bill truly isn't defined until there's lawsuits and there's the the judges have ruled on what the intent of that bill was there's no law on this there's 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 the bill but there's no interpretation of that law so there's a lot of gray area you can't get answers and then also factoring in this Um, condominiums historically are slow to pay and fast to sue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So engineers get scared off of between those two aspects. They get scared off very easily. Plus the way the bill's written and the first version of the bill said you will inspect non-invasively your interior load bearing components. So non-invasively I can't use GPR. I can't do soil borings. I need to know what the foundation looks like underground or even better yet. I need to know what my elevator shaft looks like to know if the rebar past the elevator is corroding Mm -hmm. on the 13th floor of a 15 story building. That's the way it was originally written. They, they lightened it up to make it more manageable uh, for phase one, Leo, that's non-invasive. But then if you visually see something in phase one, from my understanding, and I had the, the, uh, not the up-to-date bill, but in phase two, you could do invasive exploratory, but try to do it in a location that's going to have the least minimal impact to the building or the and grounds. Mm-hmm. The is that still other gray areas? Well, like if you fail a phase one and they don't call it failing yeah. a phase one, I call it failing a phase one. Several others in the community call it failing a phase one. But if you, if the engineer sees what they interpret as substantial structural damage, mm-hmm. and again, engineers are going to look at things differently. Some may consider it, some may not. If yeah. the engineer mm-hmm. thinks it's substantial structural damage, they then have to do what's known as a phase two inspection where they come back and they start tearing minimally tearing out components to get a grasp on your entire building so uh, for instance i see stucco bulging at a wall underneath a window on a wood frame building Mm -hmm. i'm going to want to take some of that stucco off but if it's happening in eight places around the building the state says minimal does minimal mean i do one or do all eight they could all be different so i'm going to check the worst one and do that but now it's the worst one that i can tell from the outside So is it really the worst one? And that's where we start Mm -hmm. getting into all these other questions on what does minimal, what is substantial structural damage go? Again, there's five criteria on what it is. They're all open to interpretation. What does minimal mean? 
that's open to interpretation. And unfortunately, there's no case law to define these terms. So it's all open to interpretation right now. Mm. It's interesting to know. Yeah, it's very vague. It seems like the, the engineer has a lot of uh, discretion on what is structural damage or what is, mm-hmm. um, yeah, which is never good in the yeah. engineering world. It, it's typically black or white. You know, <laughs> no op- opinion is very little to, to nil. And, and I um, find that, and maybe it's the realm that I practice in engineering with our inspections um, of second opinions with these milestone inspections, with roof claims, um, I'm not operating in a black and white world. Engineering to me is not black and white. I had one today uh, where I was in a deposition and I had their engineering report and I was tearing it apart. I'm like, no competent engineer could produce a work product like this. But they say the same thing about mine. It goes before a judge and the judge is like, well, let the jury hear both opinions, which are Mm -hmm. opposite, and the jury will decide who's correct. What are some of the most common things you're finding on these uh, milestone inspections? I know because I know you're in the thick of it. You're you're doing them right now. Or, you know, I heard that the stucco um, issues is a big thing. Spalding, spalding, spalling. Yeah. uh, Concrete. Are those two the most common? Are you seeing a lot of settlement um, issues as well? We're finding most of the defects on this. I, I The first two places we're going to look at your balconies and your walkways. And mm-hmm. if your balconies, if you're a condominium association that's dumb enough to have an open balcony and you've let your residents put tile on it, you're going to have issues. Okay. We had one where there was the breezeways, which are the walkways. So you have your balconies, which are basically your concrete coming off the back of the building where that's where your patio furniture goes. Mm-hmm. Well, you have that same thing in the front side, and it's called a breezeway. And I've had HOAs or COAs that put carpet out there. Carpet's just a natural sponge. So you rip the carpet up, and it's just all spalling, all rebar, all corrosion. So if we could eliminate balconies and walkways from the milestone inspection, we'd probably have very few problems out there with our buildings. It's just hmm. most of the problems are around those two elements. Then you move to wood frame, and depending on how they keep up with their maintenance for the building, how often they keep up with their painting maintenance, that determines how bad the stucco is going to be. If you have a 10-year paint and you go 15 years, you're going to end up with bulging in your stucco. You're going to end up with potential wood frame damage and wood rot. So a lot of this bill is geared towards our buildings being maintained. If so, how? And then the other half of this is the structural integrity reserve study, which is the budget by which you manage the building. And that's the other half of the the milestone inspection bill. Okay. And how long do HOAs have to correct these deficiencies? Is it deal with the HOA? Is it more like the person that has to actually correct the deficiency? So if it fails a phase one, you have to go into a phase two. Mm -hmm. And once the phase two is complete, you have to be moving, you have to be under contract for repairs within 365 days. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of time because what ends up happening is more often than not, your condominium association is going to be underfunded. So where's the money coming from to do the repair work that you need to be under contract for? So if you have a 60-person condominium association and you need 31 or more to vote on a special assessment to then have to collect that special assessment, you got to be doing that at the same time. You're doing your engineering plans. You're doing your bids. But you can't do your bids and your engineering plans until you have more of an idea of the price because then you can't start your special assessment until your contractor said this is what our price is going to be so one year of time in the condominium world is not a lot that's true and what are the costs of these inspections and how long do they take typically that's going to be wildly different on the firms i know that we we have a set price based on number of stories size of building we've got it down to a formula we've done hundreds of these to this point Um, we just recently got one association that was close to 100 buildings that each building needs, um, well, they need the reserve study portion of it. Mm -hmm. And they did the milestone through someone else. But we have formulas that we have it. But we've seen them as wide. Like our our bids have come in like $6,000 and our nearest competitor has been like 40. It's just because some of the engineering firms are like, they want to quantify the risk of being sued, of doing Mm -hmm. this new Mm -hmm. grounds, of there being no example documents. I'm pretty big on example documents. Like if you want me to design a seawall, which we can do. I've got 20 years of examples to look at. We can do that. We do that. We design pools. We've designed thousands of pools in Tampa. We have thousands of reference documents. All of this is brand new. There's no reference documents to really grab. 
Um, the initial and, and the reports I've seen are widely different from each other. Um, and the building departments are supposed to be the ones to say, this is the standard. But like Pinellas County, for instance, they're waiting till June 1, six months out from the deadline before they'll even start accepting the reports. So we don't even know what some of the building departments want to see in these reports. Hmm. And then we're helping educate other building departments on like, well, this worked for the city of St. Pete. This is what the city of Tampa is looking for. This is their procedure. This report has been peer reviewed by the Condominium Association Institute. We know it meets the criteria. We've had a lawyer review this format. We, we approach it from that aspect. But a lot of other firms aren't. They're just putting something together on paper and sending it in. Right. Is the uh, the ground and soil, are those common elements of supporting the, the building? Is that classified as a, a common structural element of that, the building? Or? The grounds and soil, you'd think, are considered a common element, but they're not part of the study. Hmm. It's like I get asked, like, how long will this wall last? I'm like, well, probably maintain yeah. this wall. There are buildings up there for hundreds of years. I mean, there are some buildings that have been around for thousands of years, properly maintained. You properly maintain your waterproofing. Your building should still be standing. And, and there was a great show on the History Channel. It was like if the humans died off and they showed you what would happen. Like there was one mm -hmm. episode that focused mm -hmm. on pets and they focused on dogs and how certain breeds would die off and certain breeds would, would do better. Like a German Shepherd um, or a Boxer, those types of breeds would do better than like French Bulldogs would be gone within two or generations or... Mm -hmm dachshunds they would be good in like certain grasslands but they, they focused on that survivability and then they said how plants would retake a building or how buildings would collapse and then i looked to shows like the last of us uh, which show a post-apocalyptic world being overrun in vegetation and they that show has nailed it pretty good with the whole building collapse over time so yeah properly maintained your elements can last a thousand years improperly maintained we learned from the tragic tragedy at surfside mm -hmm you'll get 25 years. Mm, right. And if it, um, you mentioned, doesn't pass phase one and you move on to phase two, what triggers a more in-depth soil study or GPR or doing SPTs, soil penetrating tests, or doing some cone penetrating tests? Like, um, would that be something that you would move towards if there was concern with the building there are the foundation settling? It depends. So. I mean, we would need to see evidence of that. I'm like, most of what we're seeing is above ground. Most of what we're seeing is walkways, breezeways. We're not finding corners of buildings settling in. We're not mm -hmm. finding the, uh, and I know on the show I've talked in the past about how a gutter downspout can cause the whole side of a building to cave in. It's, that's not something we're finding on these types of buildings. We're not finding that ground level. And, and I think part of it has to do with, and I know you've mentioned it in the past, where if you're going to build on a plot of land for a residential house, you should get a soil study done. You should have proctors done to make sure your soil is properly compacted. Those steps aren't optional on the commercial side. Yeah. That gets well, well documented. So those issues that would lead to what we see a lot of, residential pool in the backyard starting to sink into the ground. Well, I, I take one look at that. I'm like, they didn't compact the soil. It's not required. I mean, you can get an over-the-counter permit for a pool, but you can't do that for an eight-story building. So with that level of work going into the front end, most of the issues are going to be ground up. So we're not seeing a lot of settlement issues. We're not seeing a lot of soil mm -hmm. uh, foundation issues, except when we run into sinkhole areas. And then we are seeing that. And then we are needing to call for the SPTs and the G GPRs, mm -hmm. which are the soil penetrating tests and the ground penetrating radars. Right. I did see one thing in the bill. Maybe you could clarify, Leo, for me. It was it was pertained they they said something about the structural assessment and then as it is defined as 627.706 relating to the sinkhole insurance catastrophic grover ground collapse. Um, how are they relating that catastrophic ground collapse, which is the only insurance coverage that's available um, right now as far as I know for residential, but I, I did see that in the bill and I was like, how, how does that come into play with the, the structural assessment? Meaning is that you as an engineer feel that there is a eminent potential for catastrophic ground collapse? So you have to think back to when the bill was created. The bill was a two-page citizen bill. Citizens is an oh, insurance okay. company. You had one weekend. So they're like, okay. do we have anything in existence that talks about substantial structural damage? So they went straight for the sinkhole. Straight, oh, okay. straight okay. for the sinkhole. So it was funny about that is we use that as a selling feature. Like I'm a neutral evaluator mm -hmm. for the state of Florida. 
We deal with that specific statute on catastrophic ground collapse all the time. We do reserve studies. I'm a reserve specialist from the CAI. It's just like when you hire a home inspector who's an engineer, if you hire us who's a neutral evaluator, professional engineer, and a reserve specialist to do one of these inspections, we're already an expert in every aspect of what's in that bill before that bill was put into effect. Hmm. Interesting. How many, uh, curious, how many architects do you think are going to be doing these? Because I saw that also, an, I, I saw an architect, like, why, why would they put an architect in the uh, bill that they can do these inspections? It, it seems like it's only going to be engineers, but maybe there are some architect engineering firms that are doing yeah. these as well. I thought that was, I know maybe was, you get your yeah. comment on, you know, why would they open this up to architects in be, addition to engineers? Because they realized they didn't have enough engineers. Um, also, yeah. You hear architect and engineering, A and E. They, they yeah. go together a lot. But yeah, I know zero architects who are architects who that are doing these. Want to touch this? this. Yeah. Okay. And and I know last year's version of the bill, Senate Bill One Fifty Four, tried to let general contractors do the inspections. But then the engineering and architecture community stepped up and said, "Do you want a general contractor to come in there and have the power to mandate repairs?" It's like that. That's mm. too. That's too conflict of interest. Back to our previous episode about neutrality. Yeah, neutral. Mm -hmm. It needs neutral. to be somebody that's neutral. That's mm -hmm. a huge conflict yeah. of interest for a GC to do the inspection and recommend the repairs. Um, personally, as our qualifying GC, I wouldn't want anything to do with these these inspections. I feel they're much more suited uh, for somebody like yourself and an engineer mm -hmm. to do these um, than anybody because that's part of. A, part of an engineer is to protect life mm -hmm. and to make sure that the building doesn't fall down and collapse. So who better to do these inspections than engineers? Exactly. <clears throat> All right. To wrap up, can you tell us about your most memorable inspection and why? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, you can remember the downside to, if it's memorable, it's bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> True. If it's memorable, memorable it, story. Yeah. Memorable, memorable inspection in my world. Like, like sometimes, and real estate agents have told me this, Leo, you're too excited. And I'm like, yeah, you don't, you want me walking in there and you want me bored. You know, I get excited. And when they get memorable, that is usually a bad thing. Now I had this fun one. This was a fun one. This was a fire damage one. It was a townhome. Townhome caught on fire. Oh, wow. And they had put a tarp up on side, on side of the building. And so what had happened was the neighbor because it was like a town home block 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 unit, unit unit and then there was a home there was a home here well the home that was here the guy committed suicide by arson and he overdid it on the 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 fuel so the the pure heat alone like melted that entire parcel and melted the the boat dock but the fire jumped to the building so the reason why this one's so memorable is we show up to the property and to do the inspection they have to unveil the building so they have there's a tarp on the side, whole side of the building going over the top and they had to cut the tarp off so it was like the curtain coming down and it was like they unveiled the building for the first <laughs> time and i got to see it so that, that left a lasting impression and then we're going through the building and we're trying to see how tall up in the building we can get to feel safe and it was a five-story building got about two stories up and i'm like i'm not going any higher <laughs> and then we started using drones and stuff that one was pretty memorable another one that was memorable um, this wasn't related to milestone inspections, but this one's, uh, it was, um, hundred year old building, three stories, uh, was doing a re-roof. So sometimes when you're doing re-roofs, the roofers like to stack shingles on the roof. Well, they stack the shingles on the roof like they shouldn't have. Um, you're not supposed to really stack them more than three high in the bundles. They went eight high on the bundles and the roof collapsed. So, and the reason why this one was so memorable is right around the corner from where I lived. Oh, wow. So I'm driving by it after work. I'm like, that, no, no, that, 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 that's, that's an issue. But I just kept going. Because, and then the next day I saw the collapse. And then two days later, an attorney called me to represent the homeowner in the defect because I knew the attorney and he knew I lived right there. So I'm out there on a dog walk and I brought my drone with me. And I take my drone <laughs> during the dog walk and just fly it over the building to grab good pictures. And I'm glad I did it at that point in time because by the next day, that whole roof had collapsed in because once it started to collapse, no one could get the material off the roof. So I called the city and I'm like, you need to rope off the area to prevent anyone from being around this building because some of the homeless people knew the 
at that point was abandoned. So they were trying to camp around the building. And I'm like, no, you've got to remove these people now. This building is going to continue to collapse. So I fought pretty hard with the city on behalf, well, with the city to get the home torn down. And that home was torn down. But that was another very memorable. So again, if they're exciting and memorable for me, <laughs> it usually means something very, very bad for a contractor or a homeowner. Yeah. Yep. But if you're a, if you're a HOA or a property manager and you're up against this milestone inspection um, deadline and you need somebody you can trust, how can they get a hold of you, Leo? I mean, we got our website. I mean, you can Google Barrel. Um, actually, we've been doing this so long and we've become an expert in it. Um, I just found this out three weeks ago. AI now picks up our name in conjunction with this. So if you're Googling, like not Googling, if you're AIing or binging or whatever they call it, <laughs> you're using chat GPT and yeah, you type in yeah. milestone inspection, we come up in the reference, which is pretty oh, neat. That's Because cool. yeah. we have an ebook on it. We've been doing it since the day one. We've done hundreds of these. We've becoming mm -hmm. more of an industry leader in this, which was neat because when they were doing the revisions to the bill this year, I was getting call from those committee members on for input. And there was some squirrely stuff trying to get into the bill this year, but um, and we're just trying to get mm. more definition. There's certain things that we still can't do that are in these bills. And we're just trying to get more mm -hmm. definition because as you've noticed, there's conflicts yeah. between who can do what and what they need to say. It's getting mm -hmm. better. It's probably two or three revisions away from where it needs to be. But by then, it's just a once every 10 year thing for the inspections. The bulk of it should be done. And the biggest part right now is enforcement. Mm -hmm. We know there's 12,000 HOAs out there that need to have this done, that haven't said we need to have this done. But how do we find out who they are? That's true. You mentioned uh, some revisions to the bill. Are there any that really stand out to you that you'd like to share with the audience that changes, good, good changes that had to happen? Well, good from changes the from last year to this year was a lot of it was about board member education and um, conflict of interest reduction. If you're a board member, you can't hire your cousin who's the general contractor. And if you're a board member, it's making it much easier for documents to, HOAs of a certain size need to have documents available online. So it's making, it's getting more transparency, which, and I tell this to boards time and time again, and there'll be so many times I just, I just don't understand your reserve study. I'm like, you're the treasurer, right? They're like, yes. You're the treasurer of a $2 million corporation. Yes. Are you an accountant? No. Are you a CPA? No. Are you qualified to be the treasurer of a $2 million corporation? Well, not really. Then I'm like, then don't be the treasurer of an <laughs> HOA because that's what you are. You're an officer of a corporation with a direct mm -hmm. impact on human life and you have a fiduciary responsibility to that association. If I lived in a condominium, I would not want to be on a board anymore. Not that I ever wanted to be. I usually was <laughs> constricted into it. But especially now because they're trying to get the education out. They're trying to do all this, but... You are an officer of a corporation. That is what you are taking on when you're taking on the role of, a, of, an, of president, vice president, secretary of one of these HOAs. So making people realize that this year is probably the biggest improvement I've seen with House Bill 1178. Good. Cool. All great. Yeah, all great. Great educational information. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> That wraps up our podcast. Thank you so much for watching. We also want to thank Leo for joining us today. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more exciting content, and we will see you on the next one.